Man, well, I'm glad to be back and once again preaching through the book of Acts. Uh, thank you, Christina, for preaching last week and bringing a challenging word about a challenging passage in the book of Acts. And if you missed it, then I encourage you to go listen to it. Um, I did not hear it, but I did read it ahead of time, and it was a really powerful message. And so I encourage you all to, to check that out and this really challenging story about Ananias and Sapphira and um, I think that she approached that really well and helps us to think maybe um, in a more uh, life-giving, holistic way about what that passage is teaching us, about telling the truth in church. So the book of Acts is about the Spirit of God. You could say Luke is about Jesus, and Acts is about the Spirit of Jesus. And so in Luke, you have all these stories about Jesus in bodily form, doing things, growing, and changing the world uh, through his actions. And then in Acts, we read about the Spirit of God pushing that work of Jesus forward um, that Jesus started in the book of Luke. And so really, Acts is still about Jesus because it's about the Spirit of God pushing the work of Jesus forward after Jesus ascended into heaven. When we read the book of Acts, we need to pay attention to what the Spirit of God is up to. What is the Spirit of God doing in these stories that we are reading? And if we pay attention to what the Spirit of God is doing in these stories, we're going to see the Spirit of God doing some really surprising things. Some unexpected things. Doing things that no one would have ever thought that the Spirit of God would do. In Acts, the Spirit of God moves in surprising ways in unexpected ways. And the early Christians that were followers of Jesus, they were just doing their best to try to keep up with what the Spirit was doing. They were doing what they were doing, then the Spirit would come in and shake things up, and they're like, all right, well, we got to try to get on board with this new thing that the Spirit is up to. Matt Skinner, a Bible scholar, wrote a book about Acts, and I love the title of the book. It's called Acts... Catching up with the Spirit. Catching up with the Spirit. The Spirit is moving, and and throughout history, we're just trying as followers of Jesus to catch up with what the Spirit is doing. Because the Spirit is always, I think, pushing us forward into the future, carrying the message of Jesus and, and the message of the gospel into new territory and new places as we continue to witness to what God is doing here in our world. The book of Acts tells stories of the first Christians trying to catch up to what the Spirit is doing. And in our story for today, we find the leaders in the early church, which were, you know, Peter was one of the leaders in the early church. We had others as well, James. Basically, the 12 apostles were the main leaders in the early church. There were others, but they were trying to figure out kind of how to catch up with the Spirit. And what we find in the story for today is that they have to make some big changes in order to respond to rising needs in the community and what the Spirit is doing among them. You know, often today we find that leaders don't like to make big changes. Uh, We like to keep things the way they were, right? And that's just kind of the way it happens, you know? Uh, We get stuck in the past and stuck in our old ways But the Spirit, I believe, is always moving us to innovate and to to adapt and to transform and to change. The Spirit knew that change needed to happen. And little did they know, these early church leaders did not realize that their decisions in this passage that we're going to see for today would really open the door for the gospel to spread further and further and further beyond Jerusalem, even beyond Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, as we read about in Acts chapter 1. These changes that we're going to read about were necessary changes so that there was equity in their community to ensure that everyone was looked after in their community and that nobody was being left out. The Spirit of God was moving in the early church, and often what the Spirit was doing was leading them to include and care for everyone. And that's really the story, that's one of the common threads in all of Acts is that the Spirit is pushing the embrace to be wider for the early church, to include more and more and more people, even people that were viewed as inferior often, 
or viewed as different than them or people they didn't think should be a part of the movement. But the Spirit was like, no, nah, I'm going to open my arms wide and y'all are going to welcome them all and make sure all of them are taken care of. Another thing I want to say about the Spirit of God is, you'll notice in Acts, is the Spirit of God is often calling people in Acts to do things they didn't want to do. To doing things that they did not want to do. To go to people that they did not want to go to. People they did not want to love. People they did not want to talk with. People they did not want to fellowship with. And the Spirit's pushing them to do the very thing they did not want to do. And I think that's probably true today, that the Spirit is still pushing us often to do the very thing that we don't want to do. Yet the Spirit is pushing us to do it. You can clap for that, but that's also a challenging thing, right? That the Spirit's pushing us to do things that we don't want to do. And I think in this story, there's probably some truth to that in this story. Let me briefly catch you up on where we've come from and where we're going. Jesus lived among us. He died, and then He rose from the dead. After he rose, he spent a few days with his followers teaching them about the kingdom of God. One day he was with his followers, and in a moment he was gone. He was taken up into the clouds and has told his followers before he left to go to Jerusalem and wait for the promised gift of the Spirit. While in Jerusalem, the followers of Jesus were praying in an upper room, and the Spirit came upon them. Everyone heard the good news on Pentecost in their native tongue, and many came to believe. Soon after Pentecost, Peter and John were arrested. Trouble came very quickly for the early followers. They were arrested after they healed a man who couldn't walk. They were threatened, and instead of backing down, what did they pray for? They prayed for boldness, and then God shook their house to show his pleasure and excitement for their focus and their courage. They continued meeting together, sharing the good news in the streets of Jerusalem and caring for each other through sharing resources and looking after the weak. After the difficult and challenging story of Ananias and Sapphira, we read about more healings, more threats, more time in prison, beatings, and increased boldness for the followers of Jesus. It just got harder and harder, and they continued to pray for boldness, and they continued to have courage. In spite of the threats and the violence, the number of Jesus' followers, it grew. Isn't that crazy, right? That, that more threats, more violence, more hardship, it grew in spite of that. It grew and it grew and it grew. The powerful tried to stop the movement through threats, yet the movement kept going. And it, it even grew during that season of unrest. This brings us to our text for today. You know, as the movement of Jesus grew, naturally what happened is more problems also grew. <laughs> more problems arose in their community. I don't know if you've ever been a part of a growing church or a growing movement or a growing organization or even a growing family. Uh, the more people usually means the more problems, right? Uh, because where people are, there are problems. Uh, that's just the nature of, of living here in this world. And so as the church grew, there more challenges arose within their community. And they had to do their best to try to address these challenges. So we're going to read about one of those today. I'm going to read in after cha Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. So in those days, in those days of threats, in those days of imprisonment, in those days of the gospel spreading... The number of disciples was increasing. The Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution for food. So the twelve apostles gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the Word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. This proposal pleased the whole group. And so they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. 
They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and even a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So as I said, as the number of disciples increased, more needs arose in their community. In particular, this text is talking about a need that arose that widows among them were needing some special care and they were needing to be taken care of. In that time, they lived in a highly patriarchal society, which means that it was very male-dominated. And so women who lost husbands from a husband passing away would be very vulnerable to poverty, to violence, to suffering, because they needed that support in that culture. So in the Jewish community, they actually had laws and they had practices and norms set up where the widows among them were taken care of. It'd be great if we had more things like that in our own society, right? Where the widows were looked after. When their husbands passed away, they were going to be taken care of. And But what happened is, as more Jewish widows joined the Jesus movement, they became more distant from their Jewish culture and tradition and family and community. And so they needed new support networks because their old support networks were kind of not really there for them maybe like they once were. And so they started coming to the church to help care for them. And the text tells us that one way they cared for the widows among them was in the daily distribution of food. It's a very important need. We all got to eat, right? So they may have had some kind of food pantry. We don't know exactly what it was. They may have cooked meals and delivered them to people. Maybe they had produce from their farms that they would take to the different folks who needed them. I envision that the church kind of wrote it in their budget, right? It was expected the vulnerable were going to be taken care of. However, a problem arose. At this point in the story, all right, I just want to give you a backdrop. The whole Jesus movement was almost exclusively Jewish people, okay? It started out with Jewish people in Jerusalem. It was based out of Jerusalem and began really as this very small sect of Jews who had kind of branched off from their Jewish faith, still went to the synagogue and temples and that kind of thing, but they, but they also followed Jesus. They followed Jesus, who was also a Jew, right? It's important to understand, though, that there was vast diversity among Jewish people. Just like today, we have vast diversity among Christians. The Jewish faith had vast diversity, different types of Jews. And so there were Jews in this story that we're reading about that were from Jerusalem, who spoke Aramaic, sometimes it's called Hebrew in the Bible, who adhered closely to the traditions and customs of their faith. These folks were likely more resistant to like the Greek culture that was rising around them. They would have probably sought to preserve, kind of preserve their unique identity um, as they were trying to uh, navigate this more pluralistic, pluralistic society with different cultures. And Greek culture was open to lots of different things. And I imagine the Jews, the Hebraic Jews in Jerusalem, were, were really trying to hold on to the traditions of their faith and they probably would have been more adherent to the Torah and those types of things. And these in this passage are called the Hebraic Jews, all right? So that's what they're talking about. The Jews who were from Jerusalem, who spoke uh, the language there. Um, and the apostles, the, father, the 12 apostles, would have been among this particular group of Jews. But you've got to understand, there were Jews from all around the surrounding areas as well, who were also living, who had come to Jerusalem at that point. And these Jews are often called the diaspora because they were dispersed. Diaspora means the dispersion. And so there were Jews who had left Jerusalem, maybe their families years before, and they were living, uh, even generations before, had left Jerusalem or were living in different parts of the Roman Empire. Now these folks would have been a little bit different than the ones who were growing up in Jerusalem, right around the temple. They didn't have the temple. You know, they didn't have a lot of these things that the folks in Jerusalem did. And so they would have spoke Greek, which is a different language. They probably would have kind of taken on some of the Greek culture and practices and traditions of the Greek culture. They would have looked a little bit different and lived a little bit different than the Hebraic Jews. And what the text is saying that some of those folks had come back to Jerusalem and were living there 
yet they probably looked a little bit different than the other Jews. They acted a little different than the other Jews. Their traditions were a little different than the other Jews. And these folks in the passage are called Hellenistic Jews, all right? So you have two types. You have the Hebraic Jews, more adhered probably to the traditions, uh, the traditional kind of stuff of Judaism. And then you had the Hellenistic Jews that would have had more of Greek culture, spoke the Greek language, would have been a little different. This reality shouldn't be hard for us to understand. We live in a very pluralistic society here in America. We have people from, who come here from all over the world. And, and I, I, actually, I have a lot of friends who are from Mexico, and they've told me over and over and over again many different stories about how they know folks who were raised in Mexico, and when they're raised in Mexico, they're raised up with a lot of traditions and customs and stuff about Mexican culture from where they're from. And they talk about how people who are raised in Mexico sometimes are a little different than the people who are raised here. So you might have a Mexican family who's raised in America, and they take on some of American culture. Yet they also hold on to some of their Mexican culture. And, and they can be a little bit different in the way they approach the world. You also uh, see it even in Kentucky, if you have folks who move from Appalachia or eastern Kentucky and they move to a city, you know they bring some of their culture with them, but they also adopt some of the culture of a city because it's very different. Rural Kentucky is very different than urban Kentucky. And so it's kind of a mixture. And so someone who grew up in Appalachia who's moved to the city and grew up here is going to be a little different maybe than someone who's lived their whole life living in Appalachia. This is something we've experienced many times in our lives. And often these kind of differences can create conflicts. And it created conflict in this story. A conflict arose between the Hebraic Jews and the Hellenistic Jews. And the issue was that the Hellenistic Jews, their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. And so the likely scenario here is that the Hebraic Jews, the ones from Jerusalem, where the church kind of authority was based out of, they were probably the ones in charge of the daily distribution of food. And somehow... Their own people, the Hebraic Jews, were getting taken care of, but the Hellenistic Jews, were not. their widows were not being taken care of. We don't know exactly what was happening. This could have been downright discrimination where they're like, we don't want to provide for these people, and so we're not going to. It could have also been that it was just an oversight, which is still not good, but it could be that they just didn't notice the Hellenistic Jews, and they overlooked them. It could be they didn't even know them. Because their paths didn't cross. And so there were people being left out. There were also probably Hebraic Jews that looked down upon Hellenistic Jews. Maybe viewing them as like compromised. You know, it's like, well, you adopted Greek culture and you shouldn't do that because, you know, you need to be a real Jew, right? And if you speak Greek and you don't speak our language, then maybe you're not fully like us. It's possible they look down upon them. You know, we don't know why the Hellenistic widows were being neglected, but they were, and they weren't getting the food that they needed, which is a big problem. If you don't get the food you need to survive, then it's a big problem. And so the Hellenistic Jews, it says, they grumbled and they complained because their widows were being neglected. Now, instead of just continuing to grumble amongst themselves, they took action, which is the right thing to do. When we just grumble and complain and we don't take action, then it can just breed kind of negativity and not good stuff. But they didn't do that. They actually took action, and they took their complaints directly to the Hebraic Jews, and I imagine likely to the apostles themselves. And that probably took some boldness and courage to go to the apostles and tell them, hey, this food distribution you all are overseeing, it's not working out. And some of us are actually being neglected, and we need to be taken care of because our widows are hungry and they need food. Being part of the diaspora, this minority group in Jerusalem, probably would have made it even harder for them to approach the apostles, right? Because they would have probably seen a distance between themselves and the apostles. What we need to realize here is that an injustice had already found its way into the life of the early church. Very early on, we're only in chapter 6, but this injustice had already found its way into the life of the early church. You know, sometimes we think of the early church as this kind of ideal picture of what Christianity ought to be like. And if we could only get back to the early church. As you will see, and Logan points this out often, that the early church had a lot of problems. And they're constantly in conflict trying to figure stuff out. And so hopefully if that's your mindset that we just got to get back to the early church, hopefully this story helps you kind of change your mind a little bit on that because um, they had some problems. And they were already neglecting some of their people very early on. So I will say, though, I am impressed by the way the apostles responded to this crisis. 
and I want to break down what they did. So the first thing they did is they listened to the complaints of those suffering injustice. Often leaders, I'm a leader here at this church, um, and sometimes when people complain about things, you don't want to hear it. (laughs) Sometimes it's tempting to tune it out. Sometimes it's tempting just to try to ignore those people that have, or try to avoid them as much as possible. Don't pick up their phone calls when you see them. You walk the other way, right? And when it's a serious complaint, and it it kind of can be a threat to your leadership because you're like, did I mess something up really bad? It's hard to hear that. And I'm impressed that the apostles listened to the complaints of the suffering, those suffering injustice. They heard them. They gave them a hearing, and they listened to what was going on, and they paid attention to what they had to say. They invited them to the table. The second thing they did is that they dealt with the injustice openly in their community. It said they called all the disciples together. So you'll see a distinction. The apostles are the 12 disciples Jesus called, minus Judas plus Matthias, who was added to replace Judas. Now, when it talks about disciples, they're talking about all the men, women, and children who followed Jesus. And so it says they called together all the disciples, and they brought this issue to the attention of the whole group, and then they proposed a possible solution to the whole group. Now, that's pretty cool, right? Like, they had an issue. They didn't try to cover it up. They didn't try to say, well, don't tell anybody about this because this makes us look bad. No, they said, hey, let's get everybody together so everybody gets to hear what's going on and we can try to find a solution together. That's transparent, right? Often we deal with issues in secrecy, but they dealt with it openly, with transparency. I think that's pretty awesome that they did that. The third thing that they did is they let the people choose their leaders to oversee the food distribution which is also cool. They, the apostles didn't say, like, we're going to pick the seven people. They said, y'all choose seven, seven men from among you to do this. And the fourth thing that they did is they told them to choose seven men who were spirit-filled and wise. Now, often when we look at job descriptions, is that on a job desc- I mean, is that on, like, a resume, right? Spirit-filled and wise. Can you put that on your resume? I don't know. That might look weird to say, I am spirit-filled and wise. Um, but like often when we, when we, even in church, when we're looking to fill leadership roles, we look at skills, we look at talent, we look at charisma, we look at all these things, and often are they people who are led by the Spirit, and do they have wisdom? Those aren't often on the list of things we look at, yet that's what they said they needed to choose. For the, they didn't say, choose seven men who know how to cook really well, or choose seven men who are very good at organizing. They said, no. Here's what you choose seven men who are filled with the Spirit and who have wisdom. That way they can deal with what's going on in a way that's effective. Now, they did one more thing, and I want to point that out, that, that something about this men, the men that they chose is really interesting. One thing scholars point out is that all seven men that they chose have Greek names. Now, do you remember who was being neglected in the food distribution? It was the Greek-speaking widows. It was the Hellenistic widows, the ones who had adopted Greek culture, who were being neglected. And so it appears that the people chose leaders who were from the group that was being oppressed, which was the Greek-speaking people. And so instead of choosing Hebraic Jews to oversee it, they chose Hellenistic Jews to oversee this food distribution. You know, often those in power like to avoid or repress the voices of these marginal groups, but the apostles listened to them, and then they acted, and they ended up handing the whole system of caring for widows over to the people who were being neglected. Someone commented uh, when I was reading about this years ago that, and I can't remember who it was, but they commented that this is the first example they see of affirmative action in the early church that the oppressed minority was given priority and they went out of their way to make sure that their people were cared for. Those on the margins of the church, which would have been the Hellenistic Jews in Jerusalem, they were placed at the center of importance and given leadership and authority in the early church. And I'm not sure that had happened until up to this point. It's a pretty neat thing. I think most of the leadership was among the Hebraic Jews, but they brought the Hellenistic Jews in and said, okay, you all are going to have leadership now. And another cool thing about this is what happened next. It says, after they did this, it says, so the word of God spread. 
the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly after this, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. This neglected group was given real responsibility, actual authority, and meaningful leadership, and the gospel spread rapidly because of it. This is empowerment. This is giving ownership and leadership to other people. And I think the decision to hand over leadership to the Hellenistic Jews would have ensured that Hellenistic widows were never left out from the food distribution ever again. Because the Hellenistic Jews understood the injustice better than anyone. Because it was their people who were experiencing it. And they were best able to work for change. They knew all the Hellenistic widows, and they would make sure that their people were never left out again. And another interesting thing, if you look at the grand story of Acts, it's really about the movement of Jesus branching out beyond just the Jewish community all the way out to the Greeks, to the Gentiles. And I think this helped pave the way for that to happen because they gave leadership to these Greek Jews, and I think that helped open doors to future ministry to all the Greeks all across the Roman Empire. Because you think about a Jewish person who had adopted a lot of Greek culture could serve as a bridge between the Jews and the Gentiles because they understood more about their culture. They knew how to communicate to them. They were living life more among them. And so they were able to help navigate these different cultures and help people um, push the gospel forward into these new lands and all the way to the ends of the earth, as it says in Acts 1. You know, the leadership structure in the Jerusalem church, the way it was set up with the Hebraic Jews leading it was not working. People were being neglected and people were being left out. And the Spirit of God had to move in such a way that forced the structure to adapt and to change. I want to point out one more interesting part of this story. So the apostles, when this was brought to them, here's what they said. They basically said, all right, we see this as an issue. I want you all to find seven men to do this job of making sure the widows get fed because we don't have time to do it. (laughs) It's basically what they're saying. We don't have time to do this. We need to be focused on preaching the word. Now, that sounds a little bit like, okay, they said we don't need to be waiting on tables. We need to be preaching the word. You could kind of be like, really, guys? Come on. Like, you think you're too good to wait on tables? But I honestly think the apostles probably should have been preaching the word because they knew Jesus better than anyone. They lived among him. They needed to hold on to the message and the witness of Jesus, and they needed to preach that. They needed to hold on to that and share that with others. I don't disagree with what they were saying. However, I wonder if they thought that they should be the only ones preaching the gospel. We'll let those seven men do the food distribution, but we are going to be the ones who do the preaching. Well, the Spirit of God moved again in the next chapter and messes all that up. Because Stephen, the first guy mentioned in this group of seven men, he doesn't just distribute food. He ends up preaching the longest sermon in the book of Acts, actually. And he was not one of the Hebraic Jews. He was certainly not one of the apostles. Yet he ends up preaching the Word of God. The Spirit of God had other plans than what maybe the apostles had. Peter and the rest of the apostles had to catch up with what the Spirit was doing and just let it go and let the Spirit do what the Spirit wanted to do. And that required allowing this group of Jews to step up into leadership and carry on the gospel and not trying to control it all like they had been doing. And what you're going to see as you go through Acts is more and more and more examples of the the humans, the, the people in Acts trying to catch up what the Spirit was up to. Now, I want to offer just some reflection questions as we end our time related to this passage. And and this is something I want you all to be thinking about. and, And in many ways, this is also an invitation to our church to be paying attention to what happens here in our own community. But the first question is, who is getting overlooked and neglected today? Who's getting overlooked and neglected today? Because it's often easy to miss. They missed it. They didn't see that these widows were being neglected. You could think about in our society, who is being overlooked and neglected? I believe the Spirit of God pushes us to make sure that all people are taken care of. And our community, right here around our church, your community where you live, maybe even in your family, 
Often certain people and individuals and families can, can get overlooked sometimes or neglected because you've got other problems or you're dealing with this thing over here and you forget this child or this person in your family is being neglected. And even in our own church, are there people in our church who are being neglected and overlooked? We've had multiple situations where people come to me and they say, John, like these, I think that we're kind of not doing too well caring for this particular person or this particular group of folks. And, and we've had to say, like, I think you're right. Like, we need to do better. We need to do better. And so we invite you all to help us with that because we want to make sure we're a church that includes and takes care of all people. So who is getting overlooked or neglected today? And then the second question we should always ask as we're reading through Acts, what is the Spirit asking you to do about it? <laughs> because the Spirit was always calling people to do the things they didn't want to do, was leading people to have courage and bravery to step out into the unknown and take some risk. And so what is the Spirit asking you to do about it? Some possible examples. You could speak up. If you're noticing someone is being neglected, you could speak up. When you see these protest movements all across the nation, often Christians joining in with all these protesters, it's often they're speaking up and trying to raise awareness because there are people being neglected and overlooked in our society. It is a beautiful thing. It is a good thing. It is a good thing we need in this nation. But maybe you need to speak up if you see it in other contexts, maybe in your workplace if you notice this. Speak up. Have the courage. You could also be curious about others and their experience, and you could listen to them. You could just listen and say, I want to hear from you. What, this takes a lot of humility. This takes a lot of courage. If you're a leader or you're a boss, maybe ask the people who work for you about these kinds of things and be willing to listen to what they have to say. You could also invite someone to the table that hasn't been included. Think about who's not at the table here and who needs to be here. Invite them to come because they may never be there unless you open that opportunity up. You could give up power and privilege so others can rise. This is something leaders never want to do. We, we often don't want to give up our power and authority, but they had to do it in the early church or the, or the gospel would not have moved forward, right? They had to be willing to give up their privilege and their power so others could rise and carry on the gospel forward. Paul, they had a really hard time letting Paul do it. <laughs> but eventually Peter and them, they turned over a lot of the reins to Paul and he was able to carry it on out into the Roman Empire. And y'all may have other ideas about what the Spirit may be calling you to do. But I just want y'all to reflect on these questions as we continue on. This story is important because it really shows a lot of what happens throughout the book of Acts. That the Spirit is moving and challenging the early church to adapt and to change. And I believe the Spirit is still calling us today to adapt and to change and be willing to, to turn things upside down if necessary. To continue to spread the gospel and Jesus' message of love into our world. In the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.